And right, so uh, I can skip saying what I was going to say about my, myself. Thank you. Okay, so right, in this talk I'm going to talk about using formal methods to eliminate exploitable bugs, basically explore a path from the current tar pit of insecure software to perhaps, you know, greener fields sometime in the future. So I'm sure you guys are all aware that network computers are pretty much unacceptably secure and that pretty much everything these days is a networked computer. So I'm sure you're also familiar with this picture of a Jeep in a ditch that Charlie Miller and Chris Valisak uh, were able to drive there remotely using a laptop uh, over the, uh, the telematics unit in the car. It caused a big recall. And of course, this is simply reprising work that they had previously done on a Ford and a Toyota car and that others had done on BMWs and Toyotas, and that Yoshi Kono and Stefan Savage originally pioneered on an American-built car uh, quite a while ago that was the impetus for, this, uh, for the Hackums program. And cars are just one example of this, right? We see at Black Hat and DEF CON and other hacking kinds of conferences that people are regularly able to easily break into medical devices, insulin pumps, um, communication devices, SCADA systems that control things like nuclear power plants and sewer treatment plants, uh, other kinds of vehicles, lots and lots of things. So, right, it would be good if it was less easy for attackers to take control of these kinds of devices. So why is it so easy for attackers? And the reason, more or less, is because to make a system that's even plausibly secure, you have to get a lot of things right, right? First of all, the design has to be healthy and good. You have to document and, and write down and make sure everybody understands the correct architecture of the system. So basically the specifications have to be right. Then when you go around to code it, you actually have to code it without making many, many of the errors that seem so incredibly easy to make. While you do that, you have to make sure that the way you've structured the code doesn't inadvertently leak information in channels that you didn't think about. You have to make sure that when you install the software, whoever's doing the installation configures it properly so you get the behavior that you're expecting. And then you have the problem with, with people, right? People are part of the security system, so it's easy, or many people, it's easy to convince them to do things on behalf of the hacker that you wouldn't want them to do. So gullible users are part of the problem, weak passwords are part of the problem, right? Strong passwords are a pain in the neck, right? Having spent three years at DARPA where they force you to have strong passwords and change them all the time, really, that was very painful. You have the problem of malicious insiders, you have physical security issues, you have the problem that nobody builds their entire system anymore, you always build it on top of other people's code, so you have to worry about, did the other people deal with all of these things properly? Uh, you have to worry about the hardware, right? We were just seeing a hardware vulnerability a couple weeks ago that gives root access on lots of uh, platforms, and I'm sure you guys are aware of many, many more issues than that. So basically, even if you had as many arms as an octopus does, you wouldn't have enough arms to take care of all of these, all of these challenges. So basically, it's a tough, tough problem, which is why it's so hard, or why there's so many problems. In this talk, I'm going to talk about using formal methods, and I'm really just going to talk about using formal methods to focus on this problem of implementation errors. So I want to be very clear that this is just one part of this huge security problem that I'm talking about, and formal methods uh, are really focused on just a few of these areas, and I'm just going to talk mostly about implementation errors. So even if like the whole story that I'm telling you works perfectly, it's only solving part of the problem. I'm not saying that it's solving more than just this part of the problem. That said, exploitable vulnerabilities or bugs in software are an important part of the problem, right? If we don't, if we have bugs in our software that are exploitable, then we can't have good security. So removing bugs is a necessary condition for getting good security, but not a sufficient condition. So why are exploitable vulnerabilities bad or, or a problem? Well, this is the um, IBM Task Force 2012 data on reported vulnerabilities, starting from 1996 going up to 2012. In 2012, there were more than 8,000 reported vulnerabilities. And, and almost 3,500 of them, or 42% of the total, had available public exploits. So um, many, you know, high fraction of, of vulnerabilities are in fact exploitable. These exploitable bugs uh, are ubiquitous and pernicious. So we just saw a few weeks ago, uh, on July 20th, Microsoft released a patch um, for a buffer underflow in the Adobe Type Manager library that allowed an attacker to get remote code execution on pretty much, well, on all available platforms of Windows at the moment. And Heartbleed, which was in the news a lot last year, has a missing bounds check, and because of that missing bounds check, uh, attackers can exfiltrate sensitive information without leaving any kind of trace. So basically, these bugs are um, exploitable, and when they're available, they can cause lots of damage. And then they can be included in these exploit kits that naive users can deploy um, 
without, like the naive users don't actually have to understand how any of this works. They can basically just go use this package and deploy it. So that basically enables the, the masses to launch pernicious attacks at scale. So um, you really don't want to make it easy for, if, you know, if it's really hard to break into a system, well, maybe that's okay, right? It's really hard to break into lots of physical systems too, and we deal with that. But if it's really easy to break into systems, that's a huge problem. Okay, so that's just the, the really high level singing to the choir, uh, networks are unacceptably secure and implementation bugs are a big part of that. So how can we possibly make it better? So the hypothesis that a lot of the work that I'm, well, that the work I'm describing today talks about is that formal methods can eliminate many of these exploitable vulnerabilities. And probably your gut reaction, or if not your gut reaction, the person sitting next to you's gut reaction is, been there, tried that, wasn't impressed, right? Formal methods community has been saying for 50 years that they can verify software, it won't have bugs, and we will be in security nirvana. So uh, obviously I wouldn't be standing here if I really believed that. So uh, what I want to talk about for a bit is, you know, why is now a good time to revisit this hypothesis that formal methods might actually have something useful to say about improving security by removing exploitable bugs. So the first thing uh, to observe is that formal methods have benefited enormously from Moore's law and Denard scaling up to the point when Denard scaling stopped. So computers these days are way, way more powerful. They have many more transistors, they have, the cycles are much faster, and they have a lot more memory. And all of that helps formal methods-based tools enormously because a lot of formal methods is about searching. So the more power you have to search, the more you can do. So another big advantage has to come, uh, comes about because of increased levels of automation. So what, is, what does that mean and what does this slide have to do with it? So this slide is talking about the satisfiability problem. So the satisfiability problem is given a Boolean formula, so a formula over Boolean variables, come up with a truth assignment of true and falses to those Boolean variables that makes the overall formula true. This sounds like a really boring problem. It was proved a long time ago to be NP complete, and so it was dismissed for a really long time as not a very interesting problem because it was too hard to be practical and it wasn't very uh, expressive. But it turned out that both of those observations were, were wrong. So it is NP-complete in general, but it turns out many, many instances are efficiently solvable. And it turns out that many problems in formal verification can be encoded in really, really big Boolean formulas that you can then throw to the SAT solver and have it tell you the answer, whether it's satisfiable or not. It doesn't always tell you, right? Sometimes it runs into the NP-completeness and it can't come up with an answer, but a lot of the times it does. And so what is this slide showing? So there's a competition every year where people from all over the world enter their, their uh, SAT solver to compete for which one is the best, which one's the fastest, which one can solve the most problems. So every year somebody comes up with a competition which is a set of challenge problems, and then they run all of the entries against that set of challenge problems. And you have, about, you have two hours to solve as many problems as you can. What Daniel Lebert did is he took the winning SAT solver from, 19, from 2002 to 2010, and he ported all of them to one machine, and he ran all of them on the SAT 2009 competition problems. And the graph here on the horizontal axis is the number of problems that's been solved, and the vertical axis is how much time it took. So one dot represents a particular solver. How long it took to get to uh, that particular point is on the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is which problem number it was that that particular solver solved. So each line represents one SAT solver. So the ones on the far left in really light green are the solvers from 2002. Whereas the ones that are on the bottom right hand corner, the dark green circles, are the solver from 2010. And these curves, while still going up quite steeply, show huge improvement. If you look at the, if you just pick the point of 80 problems solved, the best solution in, um, in 2002, the time required was 1,000 seconds, whereas in 2010, it was only 40 seconds. So that's two orders of magnitude improvement in how long it took to solve that problem. Um, Right, and that's, that two orders of magnitude improvement is on top of the improvements that already came from the hardware scaling, because these are all being run on exactly the same platform. So although this problem is very low level kind of a problem, it turns out it's the basis for a lot of automation and a lot of theorem improvers, and so it, it makes formal methods scale much better. So and another reason why now is a good time to explore use of formal methods is that the tool base for formal methods has just exploded over the last 10 to 15 years. So before, 10 to 15 years, whenever somebody wanted to go do a formal methods-based approach to reasoning about software, they had to go build the tool, the formal methods tool, and then apply it to whatever they were trying to do. So their effort was split between building the tool and using the tool to do something effective. Whereas now, there's a vast marketplace 
well, vast reformal methods, but there's a, there's a large number of tools that are available off the shelf that people who are interested in using them can go and use them and not have to do research on the tools themselves. Right? They don't have to be researchers in formal methods tools. They can just be people who want to use formal methods tools. So there's a quote here from Gerwin Klein, who is one of the, the leads of the NICTA SEL4 project, talking about this fact that basically now um, th these future efforts, which are the ones that are happening now, can build on these tools and reach far-ranging verification goals faster, better, and cheaper because they don't have to start from scratch. Okay, so that was basically what I told DARPA about why DARPA should invest in using formal methods to remove exploitable bugs. So, is there any truth to this hypothesis? Is it worth going forward? So uh, here, I can offer you some evidence. Hackems is just now finishing its second phase, so it's had three years to run. These slides show the results for the first 18 months. So the setup of the, of the program, as I said, is the, hy the hypothesis of the program is that formal methods can yield vehicles that are less susceptible to remote cyber attack. So we were focused specifically on, on vehicles, although the belief is that the techniques would work for many other systems as well. The threat model that we're considering here is the attackers don't have physical access, so they can't physically touch the things that they're trying to attack. They have to attack wirelessly. Um, but they're allowed full knowledge of the system and the source code. So they get to, they see all the source code, they get to talk to the developers, they get to sit in on all the developers' meetings, so they can know as much about the system as, uh, as, they, can, as they can. We're also assuming that the hardware is correct. So, uh, we know that's a bad assumption, but you can't do everything at once. So we're just assuming for the purposes of this program that the hardware is correct. And we're working on a number of platforms, uh, two of which are the Arducopter, which is a, you know, a toy UAV available from Amazon, and the other is Boeing's Unmanned Little Bird. Um, and it turns out the researchers were able to, in the first phase, the two platforms were pretty different. In the second phase, they modified the architecture of the Arducopter so that it has two processors in the same configuration that the ULB has two processors. So this, the structures tend out to be quite analogous. Okay, so at the beginning of the program, we had a red team, which is AIS uh, in Rome, New York, attack all of the platforms unmodified, just as they were off the shelf. And not surprisingly, the red team was able to take over control over all of the platforms that we gave them. So the, the Arducopter, they were able to show it, demonstrate it where they had the, the blue team was flying the quadcopter, the red team was able to connect to the quadcopter while it was in flight, crash the ground control station for the, the blue team, uh, cause the uh, quadcopter to no longer listen to the blue team radio, and then listen to the red team as the red team basically flew it off into the sunset or into their hands, right? It's not all surprising that that was what they were able to achieve. The, art, the quadcopters are designed to be easy to connect to. The fear of the manufacturers is that you lose connection with the copter, not that a bad guy takes over control of the copter. So there was like no security in place whatsoever. So they didn't even have to like try to break in, try to find a vulnerability. They could just connect to it and use its existing protocols to achieve that effect. So the baseline security was really, really low. And there's a video here showing a demonstration of that, but I don't think this audience needs to see it. If you want to see the video afterwards, you can come and talk to me and I'll show it to you. Okay, so what was the structure of this MACM copter? So the horizontal, the line at the bottom shows a block diagram of the system. It starts out in the bottom left-hand corner as the commercially available software. It's basically a monolithic software, piece of software. There's no runtime operating system, sorry, real-time operating system. There's no security um, running on pretty weak hardware. And so right away they put in a more powerful processor and then they factored the code base so that it could run a free RTOS. And then on top of that, they built a hardware abstraction layer so that the software above it could think that it was still running on the original platform. They made that hardware abstraction layer available to the, um, to the uh, UAV community that, that gave it an award for the best contribution back to the community of that year. And then they took the the autopilot software and, and had it, rewrote it to run on top of the hardware abstraction layer. So now they have a system that they feel like they can start working with to build a more secure system. So that is all in, in white because none of that is high assurance software, it's just software that runs. They then uh, re rebuilt the system so that instead of using free RTOS, they were able to use eKronos. eKronos is, is a verified runtime operating system that NICTA is building, so it's still under development and the proofs are, I think, almost done. Maybe they were finished last night. Anyway, it's, it, the proofs are in progress, but it's written with the intent of being verified in a theorem prover. And then the, the flight control code was rewritten um, over time in domain-specific languages embedded in Haskell that are, that 
you write code in Haskell and then it generates C code that's guaranteed to be memory safe and it generates assertions to check things like integer overflow kinds of operations that they can then discharge using other formal methods based tools. And then Rockwell Collins at the top has an architecture description language that describes the entire architecture of the system, including both the hardware and the software systems, and it allows them to prove properties about the entire software stack by using properties of the individual component pieces. So by the end of phase two, the picture on the right-hand side is what was available. So 80% of the software on the platform had been written or generated using high assurance tools. Um, and there were overall system properties uh, proved by, by Rockwell Collins. So an example of an overall system property is that only messages that have been authenticated are actually delivered to the quadcopter to be executed. And Rockwell Collins started with a, uh, a model of the, the flight control software that they thought was accurate, and they started proving properties over that because they had to wait for their partners from Galois to actually write the code for them to work on for real. And uh, after a while, Galois actually delivered the code and the, the architecture description that comes with the real code is generated from the code. So part of the DSL that they were using to write the flight control software also generated the architecture of how, what are the different components and how do they talk to each other. And when they plug that, that uh, derived specification into Rockwell Collins' tools, the theorem that they had proved that said only authenticated messages are ever executed immediately went to false. The, the thing went from green to red because in the actual system there was another channel, there was a safety radio channel that allowed another connection to come in and take control of the vehicle. So the, the architecture level tools were able to find that, that side channel and immediately flag a problem so that, that needed to be addressed. So that's an example of what kind of things that the architecture level proofs are doing. So the results from phase one, the smack copter was able to fly. It had stability control, altitude hold, directional hold, and, and denial of service detection. So the first three of those were part of the original um, platform. The denial of service detection was something that they added, and it responded in an application-specific way, right? There's no a priori right way to respond to a DOS attack. You know, if you're a military system over Iraq, maybe the right thing to do is self-destruct. If you're flying over, you know, a parking lot, maybe you should just land, right? It, it's, it's not clear what the right thing to do is. Um, and so they just had it, you could program what it, what it should do. And then it also had GPS waypoint navigation about 80% implemented. So it had, almost, it had almost all the functionality of the original quadcopter. And they did that in 16 months, um, all of the work that I described in the previous slide. The air team, they were able to prove system-wide properties of the, the new quadcopter. They could prove that the system was entirely memory safe. They could prove that any malformed message was not going to be processed, it was just gonna be dropped. So you couldn't fuzz test the platform. You, you, you're, you could fuzz test it, but it wouldn't do anything except drop all your malformed messages. It ignored all non-authenticated messages, and all good messages that were received would eventually reach the motor controller. So they couldn't prove that the radio was, that any good message that was sent would actually be executed, just the good messages that were received, because a bad guy could actually jam the channel, and they couldn't do anything about that. This platform was then given to the red team. The red team had full access to the source code for six weeks. They had full access to the design process as it was going. And at the end of that six week period, they found no security flaws, um, despite having full access to the system. So a, a penetration testing expert who was a colleague at DARPA, his assessment was that that copter is probably the most secure UAV on the planet. And it's all available uh, open source. So that was at the end of 18 months. The last three days I've been at the Hackham's PI meeting, which was just at the end of phase two, so at the end of three years. And so what they've done in the three years, as I, as I mentioned earlier, they took that original quadcopter that just had one processor and they split it so that it had two processors. One is the flight control computer that is running on top of eChronos. The other is the mission control computer that's running on top of SEL4. They communicate via a CAN bus. And they created that architecture because it's analogous to the architecture of the unmanned little bird that also has two computers, one of which running, one of which will eventually run SEL4 and one of which, or sorry, eChronos, the mission, the flight control computer, and the mission control computer on the ULB is running SEL4 at the moment. They then ported the code from phase one to the unmanned little bird and they had a flight test a month ago. So they actually ran the Boeing helicopter that's large enough to have, it is autonomous, but it can have up to two passengers, including a safety pilot. So they ran the, the ULB with the safety pilot uh, using the high assurance code and the safety pilot at the end of the test reported that he didn't notice any difference flying the high assurance version of the little bird versus the previous version that he had flown many times. So that's like the best that you could hope for, right? The security stuff didn't change the flight behavior of the quadcopter. 
um, on the, the small, the Arducopter one, all of the flight control software is now generated using high assurance tools. So I said at the end of phase one, 80% of the code was high assurance. Now 100% of the flight control code is high assurance. And then we gave to the red team, um, we configured SCL4 with multiple partitions, right? SCL4 is a separation kernel or can be configured to be a separation kernel. We configured it with multiple um, processes and we gave red the red team root access in one of those processes and challenged them to break out of the, um, of the sandbox uh, or to disrupt the flight of the quadcopter within their, their process. And they were not able to do either of those things with the same level of resources that they had before. So they couldn't break out and they couldn't disrupt the flight of the, of the quadcopter. Um, they could crash themselves, right? They could fork bomb themselves and then they died and that was, you know, that was what we expected, right? So very promising results from the end of phase two. Okay, so that's an uh, overview of the Hackums program in general. Um, I've been telling you a lot about different kinds of form. I've been saying a lot of words that mean something to the formal methods community, but what are they a little bit more specifically? So I want to give you an overview of formal methods. So first of all, what is this term formal methods, right? It's this hopelessly vague, mushy kind of thing. So, you know, a textbook that was written in 2003 says that formal methods are best described as the application of a fairly broad variety of theoretical computer science fundamentals to problems in software and hardware specification and verification. It's kind of a circular definition, right? If you understand what formal methods means, you can read this paragraph and say, yes, that's what formal methods means. But if you don't know what formal methods means, you really don't know anything more after reading this than you did before. So it's a little bit like what Justice Potter Stewart says, you know, you know it when you see it. So my definition is more a set of characteristics. It's based on math, it's machine checkable, and it's capable of proving properties about code and or models. And, uh, right, it's important that you read the fine print, right? All formal methods have assumptions built in, and if you don't satisfy the assumptions, all bets are off. The assumptions may not apply to your system, and the guarantees that are being provided might be too weak. So whether or not a particular formal methods-based tool is useful for what you're doing is something that requires judgment. So in this slide, I'm trying to convey a sense of the space of formal methods tools. There are a large number of different formal methods tools and they have very different characteristics. So the horizontal access is how much user effort does it take, which is highly correlated with how scalable it is. The more user effort, generally, the less scalable it is. The left-hand side are things that are fully automatic, and they essentially scale just as well as our ability to write code. On the right-hand side, it takes you know, years of PhD-level work to be able to do something, and it scales to kind of thousands, tens of thousands, 50,000 lines of code. On the vertical axis is how strong are the guarantees that the formal methods-based tool is giving you. The very bottom, we have type safety, which is kind of like minimal level of, of uh, information about a program, but still more than nothing, right? More than an untyped language. In the middle, we have a guarantee that there are no runtime errors. So you don't have buffer overflow, you don't have buffer underflow, you don't have integer overflow, things like that are in this middle category. And at the very top are full functional correctness. There's a specification and the implementation does exactly what the specification says and no more than what the specification says. So it does what it's supposed to and it doesn't do what it's not supposed to. So not surprisingly, it's a lot harder to get functional correctness than it is to get type safety. So as you probably guess, type systems occur in the bottom left-hand quadrant. They're almost entirely automatic, although in many languages you have to add type annotations, and the fancier the type system, generally the more annotations you have to add. And also, like this, I, I talked about assumptions, right? So Java and Haskell types, well, the Java type system is mostly sound, except for the assumption of native code. The same thing with Haskell, it's mostly sound, except for the unsafe perform IO operation. If you call unsafe perform IO, you're kind of implicitly signing this contract that you says that that unsafe part means you could break the type system using this construct. It's your responsibility. And of course, the C type system, you have to be very careful about what you write in C to guarantee that the type system is actually giving you a type safety guarantee instead of just some good, you know, some useful information for the optimizing compiler. So the next level up are symbolic execution tools, things like fuzzball and Klee. There was a paper here earlier on unconstrained Klee. Um, these scale really well, but the kind of properties they prove are relatively weak. So they've been analyzing things like bind to compare two different versions of functions to see if they differ, or to compare an old version and a new version to see if there was a bug introduced during the two, or to look for particular uh, sort of runtime error kinds of properties. So these techniques scale really well, but tend to prove relatively weak properties, at least at the moment. 
The next level up are model checkers. Model checkers can work over code or models. They take a proposition and they take a model and they search through the space of the model in very clever, very intelligent ways to see if they can find counterexamples, things that violate the proposition. And you, the way you work on real code with this is you take the code and you abstract a model from it and then you try to prove, try to find a counterexample in the, the model for that proposition. Now if you find a counterexample, you may not have actually found a problem with the proposition. The problem might be that your model is too coarse, that you abstracted too much information. But you can figure that out by taking the counterexample that the model checker found and running it in the full real code base and seeing is it a counterexample on the code base as well. If it is a counterexample in the code base, then you found a problem that you need to fix. If it's not a counterexample in the code base, then you need to refine your model so that it's no longer a counterexample in the model and then you can rerun the process. And so this is something that Microsoft has used very effectively to remove bugs from their drivers, right? They had this huge problem 10, 15 years ago where you got the blue screen of death all the time and Microsoft got blamed, even though most of the time the problem was in the device drivers, which was a third party that Microsoft wasn't you know, directly responsible for. So they developed this technology and then they forced device drivers to pass the model checking tests before they would ship them with Windows. And that blue screen of death has become way less common as a result. Um, also, so you pro the distributed systems protocols link on the left, I should explain the chart. On the right hand side, the things on the right are the formal methods tools. The things on the left are systems that have been verified or reasoned about using that tool and a company or an organization that has done so. The distributed systems protocols is in italics because all the other examples that I'm going to show you are places where people were reasoning about code. The distributed system protocols, Amazon is reasoning about the, the design of their distributed protocols using um, the temporal logic model checker. Um, and they've been finding tons of bugs in code that they think is too esoteric for them to have been able to find the bugs by hand. They just published a paper about this a few, you know, maybe in 2014. Okay, so another um, kind of formal model tool is a sound static analyzer. So the examples of this are things like Astray or Pharmacy or Infer. They, the Astray has been used to prove that the code running on the Airbus doesn't have integer overflow, integer underflow, uh, uh, bounds check kinds of errors. Uh, the Pharmacy has been used in a Polar SSL uh, implementation of SSL stack to, again, uh, prove the absence of those kinds of, of bugs. And recently, um, Facebook has started to run infer another static analyzer on the entire code base of uh, the Facebook uh, applications, both on the Android platform, the web platform, and the iOS platform, looking for uh, memory errors and uh, null pointer errors and resource allocation errors. So another level up are verified runtime monitoring. So this is like software fault isolation, but where the SFI implementation has been verified in a theorem prover. So, the, um, so this is in the context of uh, Chrome browser, browser, browser from Google, uh, where they're running code natively, and they want to check that that code that's running natively uh, satisfies certain properties. Specifically, they want to make sure that data accesses are from, you know, reads and writes are from a particular segment of memory, execution is from a disjoint segment of memory, um, all so certain system calls are not allowed, all calls to the browser go through a particular interface, and there's one more, oh, that uh, all jumps are 32-bit aligned to try to get away from ROP kind of attacks. Um, so Google had a sandbox, and RockSalt is an improvement over what, well, RockSalt is a formally verified version of that that checks that those properties are hold. The, they've formally verified that the checker actually does guarantee that the code that the, is being checked has those properties if it's approved by the system. So the, the property that it holds of the uh, native code is relatively weak. The property that holds of the sandbox mechanism, the SFI checker, is very, very strong. It's proved in a, in a uh, theorem prover. Right. Then the next level up is automatic theorem provers. So here we're getting close to being able to prove things like functional correctness, um, but instead of, well, but it's done in a way that the propositions are automatic, the things that need to be proven are automatically extracted from the code plus some annotations, then those things are fed into um, SMT solvers and uh, automatic theorem provers to prove the properties automatically instead of having humans involved in the loop. So a company in China, or a group in China has used this to uh, verify uh, an RTOS that is used on automobiles in China. So this particular OSEC certified vehicle OS that they've been working on called Orientias runs on something like 1.4 million cars in China. 
And Microsoft has used similar technology to verify that a garbage collector is, a, is correct. Then at the farthest end of the spectrum, so the most powerful formal methods tools proving the richest set of properties are ones that use interactive proof assistance. So um, these are the ones that require <laughs> PhD years to be able to do, but they're also the ones that prove amazing guarantees about the code that's being done. So the two sort of most canonical examples here are the SEO form microkernel that I've been talking about a little bit, the one that Nikta developed, and then the one that Hackems is using on the quadcopter and the, the ULB. There's also Compsert, which is a verifying C compiler out of INRIA. And then researchers at UCSD have built a, a browser where they verified key parts of the browser using, a, using COC. There was a paper here presented yesterday by Leonard, who's in the back, verifying parts of, uh, verifying the HMAC and SHA-256 protocols. And then MIT researchers have at SOSP coming up a verified file system. Um, right, that'll be presented in a few, in a month or two. Right. So what do people who use formal methods have to say about the effectiveness of these formal methods? So this, this data comes from a paper on formal methods practice and experience that appeared in ACM competing surveys in 2009. So it's a little bit out of date. If you look at the date of a lot of these seminal results, they've come out in the last five or six years. So take that with a grain of salt. The data was generated by the authors of the paper, identified a whole bunch of different projects all around the world that were using formal methods, and it sent them a questionnaire asking them about their experiences. So the data was collected between 2000 and, at the end of 2007 and the end of 2008. The questionnaire was sent to 62 different groups that were using formal methods, and this data was compiled from their responses. So it should definitely be taken with a grain of salt because these are all responses from people who had chosen to use formal methods for something, so biased sample. <laughs> Given that, they could still hate it, and they seem not to hate it. So the graph shows three different uh, measures. One is, how did the use of formal methods affect the time of your project? The second one is cost, and the third one is quality. And there are three different possible responses, right? One was that it made things better, one was that it made things worse, and one that it had no effect. So on the time thing, it's pretty interesting, right? In that 35% of the people thought the use of formal methods actually made it faster, right? They do say in the comments that the speed it shifted where they spent the time, right? That they, the beginning stages before they had stuff working was much longer than usual, but once they got past that stage, it was much faster to get to the, uh, something that worked. So they kind of, you shifted the time around, and at least some, you know, a third of the people thought that that shift was actually a net positive. 53% uh, thought it had no effect, and 12% thought it was slower. And again, you, another grain of salt is these people are working on software that they think it's worth using formal methods for. So they might have already been doing something that was much more time consuming than your normal software process. Cost kind of fact, you know, mirrors the time data. And then the quality, pretty much everybody thought that the quality of their code had improved as a result of the formal methods techniques. Okay, so that's an overview of what formal methods are and what people who work in the field think about using those tools. So you in the security community might say, well, you know, or I might ask you guys, what, if you could have 10 software artifacts that needed to be verified, that needed to like not have implementation bugs, what would those artifacts be? And some candidates for that are the ones that are listed here on the slide, right? It would be really nice to have a separation kernel. It'd be really nice to have a hypervisor. It'd be really nice to have a real-time operating system, a C compiler, a file system, a web browser, a sandbox, various crypto algorithms, garbage collectors. I'm sure there's more things that you could add to the list, and I'd love to hear from you what you think should be added to that list. But all of these things here actually have a fully verified, functionally correct implementation available. Now, they're not feature complete necessarily. They're not the, the richest, most new, fancy versions of things, but real enough to be able to get real work done running in these verified systems. And you can see from the publication dates that a lot of these have been in the last five years. So things have really changed in, this, in terms of what formal methods tools are capable of doing in this most recent time period. So I just want to dig in a little bit into two of these. So I've been talking a lot about the SEL4 microkernel. So it's a general purpose operating system microkernel. They've proven that you can configure it so that it is actually a separation kernel. They've proven that you get non-interference between things that are running in different processes in that separation kernel. And that's what the red team was testing, right? To, is their theorem true? And, and the red team, although they definitely said that just the fact that they couldn't break out didn't mean that another team couldn't break out. So, um, right, they're hedging their bets. So they implemented it and proved it correct in Isabel Hall, which is an um, interactive theorem prover. The code base was 10,000 lines of code for the implementation of the microkernel and 480,000 lines of proof, right? So huge, huge. Most of the work, 
in terms of lines of code is in the proof, not in the code base. It took them 13 person years to do this, although they estimate the eight in parentheses is if they had to do it again, they could do it in eight years because five of those person years were building infrastructure tools that they, wouldn't, they could just reuse, they wouldn't have to rebuild again in the future. How fast was it? So the key performance indicator in a microkernel is how fast you can do inter-process communication. So they measured how many cycles it took um, in an unverified sort of the state of the art comparison was 206 and it was 227 in their implementation. So some performance degradation, but fast enough that it was, it's usable for real applications. And they've proven a whole bunch of machine checked theorems about this implementation, including that they get access control and for, um, enforcement Different processes can't interfere, including there's no timing side channel attacks. That's part of this proof. The they, they verify the C code at that C code level, but then they also verify that the compilation of that C code down to assembly code is correct. So they're not, they didn't use ComCert. They're not proving that the compiler is correct. They're just proving that that translation was correct. And they, they implemented a, a fast path to do the IPC, and they proved that that separate fast path was, was correct. And to get a sense of the complexity, this graph on the bottom left-hand side is the call graph of SEL4. So each node in that graph is a function, and the links are this function called that other function. So it's, it's designed to be a, a high-performance uh, microkernel. And it's all available open source. And there's a journal paper that appeared last year in Transactions on Computing Systems that's really good overview of this project. So if you're all interested, I would definitely recommend going and looking at that paper. Okay, then the other project that I want to highlight is the ComCert Verifying C compiler. So in the, in the programming language community, which is my background, the, the challenge of coming up with a compiler that is fully verified from end to end has been a grand challenge in the community forever. And Xavier published this paper in 2006, and I would say as late as like 2004, people thought it was impossible, it would never be done. So it went from impossible to he's done it, um, very short period of time. So it's not entirely all of C, it's the subset of C that is used by the av aviation industry. Uh, so in particular, there's no concurrency. Uh, so that's a big like missing thing from the language. But many applications actually don't have concurrency and so it's still wild, very broadly applicable. He implemented and proved correct the system in COC. So we don't have a separate lines of code of the compiler and lines of code of the proof because it was all mixed together in a single system. One of the things about the COC uh, theorem prover is that you can extract functional code from the theorem prover. So you can write your code in the theorem prover and it will generate uh, functional code that can be compiled and run. And that's in fact the source code for the ComCert compiler. It took Xavier three person years to do this. So it really should be like three Xavier years because Xavier is unbelievable, right? He's not the same as a normal person. So you need to take that three years with a, a grain of salt. He's one of those you know, amazing, amazing programmers. And then in terms of performance, the, um, the ComCert compiler is twice as fast as GCC if you compile GCC without any optimization. If you compile GCC with 01, it's seven, ComCert is 7% slower, and with 02, it's 12% slower. And with all performance measurements, your mileage may vary. Your particular program might fall in the sweet spot of ComCert or might fall in the sweet spot of GCC. So these are statistical numbers over you know, test suites and not applicable to any particular um, piece of code. And it's in the process of being certified to be able to be actually used for the compilation of Airbus software. Um, and work has continued on the system, so more and more compiler optimizations have been added. The proof has been extended to cover more front-end stuff. Um, basically, there's and other researchers are working quite hard on adding concurrency to it, adding support for other kinds of proof engines. So this is a very much a living project that, that's still going on. Okay, so I've been talking about what formal methods can give us and how they've been successfully used to verify things that people might actually care about, but you're not all using formal methods already, except for Leonard in the back. So there's, there's some reason for that, right? So what are the reasons? So one is the problem of expertise. The same survey paper that I talked about earlier estimated that in 2006, the, this, the number of formal methods researchers in the planet was under 6,000, if you add those numbers up, right? So there just aren't that many people who know how to use these tools. So that's certainly fixable. We, we can teach people how to use these tools. Um, I was just talking with Andrew Powell uh, yesterday, who teaches a class at Princeton, and every year he gets 50 to 60 students who take his class on verifying software because they, they have to satisfy a theory requirement, and they think that that class is the easiest way to satisfy the theory requirement. So it's full of students who think they actually aren't that good at theory, 
And by the end of the semester, they're all able to effectively do the assignments, prove properties of the program. So it's very, you know, it's something that can be taught, but it's something that has to be learned. So expecting, you know, an, a novice to just sit down at the tool and being able to be immediately productive is about as foolish as expecting, you know, a freshman to be able to sit down at the Java console and be able to program without being taught a lot about how to do it. But at the moment, there's a dearth of people who can do this kind of thing. Another big concern is the level of effort, right? We saw, we saw that the overhead of the SEL4 was 480,000 lines of proof for 10,000 lines of code, right? That's a huge, huge overhead. Um, you can, so this chart shows the uh, lines of code and the lines of proof for all of the formally verified systems that I showed you a, a couple of slides ago. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of variation in how much effort the proof took compared to the, the code. Um, it varies based on two things, right? One is how much code are you trying to, well, actually three things. How much code are you trying to prove something about? Um, how complicated the properties are that you're trying to prove? And whether or not you got to write the code that you're trying to prove properties about, or if somebody else wrote the code a while ago and you have to verify their code. So the reason why SEL4 has so many lines of proof is because the specification of what they're trying to prove is really quite complicated. And the properties that they're trying to prove are really very, very deep. The, uh, the CompCert system, in contrast, the, the lines of proof are much smaller. Estimates are that the compiler itself is something about 10,000 lines of code, and the proof is about 32,000 lines of code. So it turns out a compiler is actually really pretty easy to specify, right? What is the specification of compiler? The semantics of the generated code correctly implements the semantics of the source code. That's much easier to say and write down formally than specifying what is the correct semantics of a, a, a microkernel, right, an operating system. And then the, the lines for the SHA-256-HMAC, that's the only project on this uh, slide that verified somebody else's code, right? They verified the 1999 implementation of HMAC-256, uh, or HMAC and, and SHA-256. So they had to deal with the code as it was written by somebody else. Turns out it's much easier to verify code if you write the code while you're doing the verification, both because there's lots of times where you could do something one way or another, and it turns out one of those ways is really easy to verify, and one of those ways is really hard to verify. And if you know you're going to do the verification, you're going to choose the way that's easy to verify. It's also the case that if you're writing the code and the verification at the same time, you know all the invariants that need to be captured, whereas if you find a pile of code that somebody else wrote a while ago, you have to figure out what those invariants are and capture them. The other thing to notice is that although at the top the level of effort is really high, at the bottom the level of effort is really quite reasonable. Right? If you really care that your browser, you know, some, what code is running in, a, in one tab can't screw up the bank account information in your other account, the other tab, then maybe you're willing to have somebody spend half a person year to be able to guarantee that separation, which is what's provided by the, the Quark web browser. Okay, so I would say that the required level of effort is still really high, but for certain kinds of software, I think it's getting to the point where the required level of effort is actually a good investment. And this, uh, this was a point that was discussed quite a bit at the Hackham's PI meeting is, what is the cost of buggy software? And how much is the cost, like you wanna compare, well how much does it cost to provide, to produce an unverified version versus the cost to produce a verified version? It's like, well the verified one's gonna be much higher because you have to have more expertise and it's gonna take longer because you have to do more work. It's like, well that's true, but the unverified version is gonna be more vulnerable to attacks. Like what if we got to charge the unverified version with the cost of Chrysler's recall of having to replace all that software? If you start to consider costs like that, well then maybe the cost comparison isn't clear, or maybe the formal methods cost is way lower for certain kinds of application. I'm not saying, you know, all application code should be verified to these standards. I'm saying that there's critical pieces of software that we can identify that should be verified to these standards and that we could probably make a back of the envelope cost uh, calculation that shows that the formal methods version is less expensive. There's another issue which is, of course, the person who pays the cost of the development and the person who pays the cost of the downstream problems that arise because the code is, is buggy are often different people. And the person who's spending the money is not necessarily the person who's paying for the, for the vulnerability. And so that makes it more complicated to motivate people to invest in using the formal methods-based techniques. Okay, so another concern about using formal methods tools is the performance. So again, this slide shows what I was able to extract from papers about these same systems that we've been looking about at in terms of their performance. And the, the bottom line is that verified code is not intrinsically slower, but verifying faster code can be more time consuming. 
And so what generally happens is people who are building verified systems work on the code until it's fast enough to accomplish what they need to do, and then they do the proofs or they finish the proof and they stop. They don't keep trying to make it faster, even though it could be faster, they don't, that extra speed doesn't help them particularly. So this is example of what's going on with SEL4. They could definitely continue working and get it to be a, a faster IPC time and verify that, but they felt like the return on investment wasn't worth it. It was fast enough and so they stopped. Um, it's also the case that when you compare the verified version speed to the unverified ver version speed, you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples because the unverified one could be wrong, right? So you have to take into consideration, you know, how, what's the chance that the unverified version is wrong when you're doing that head-to-head -head speed comparison. It's also the case that the formally verified version is not always slower. The, the rock salt implementation of the sandbox in Chrome processes a million instructions per second, which was faster than the Google uh, checker that was already there. Um, sometimes, because you're in the theorem proving situation, you can prove invariance. That means you can eliminate checks that you didn't eliminate before because you weren't sure that it was there. So it, it can be the case that your verified code can run faster. And, and the SEL4 guys reported in several cases that this was the case, that they were able to eliminate checks because they could prove that they were superfluous. But in general, it is true that formally verified code is slower, and it's usually slower just because the time to do the complete verification of the current fastest thing is just, it takes more time, and, and people who've been doing it felt like that extra mile hasn't been worth it. Another problem is the delay, the lag, right? A lot of the industry today, it's how fast you can get the code out there. And if you have to get the code out there with a proof, well, that's gonna slow you down. And if you're a startup competing against somebody else and you're slower, you're dead, right? So you can't be slower. And it's for that reason, it's the same thing that I was talking about before. Many of the artifacts that we've been looking at lack features because of the, the time that it takes to get them verified. So the fully functional correct stuff, that's gonna be a problem for a long time. Um, there is some formal methods approaches that scale better. So Facebook, for example, has just uh, started using uh, the infer sound static analyzer. Basically, they bought a company started by formal methods people for reasoning about C code. And those formal, researcher, formal methods researchers who now work at Facebook have been looking at and working on applying their static analysis tools to the Facebook code base. And they have been able to process basically the entire Facebook code base for Android and iOS overnight. It takes them four hours. They can, they've also been integrated into the normal code process. So now when somebody checks in a change, the formal methods tools, the infer tool runs over that and reports back results to the user and they have to pass those checks before they're allowed to check in the changes. And the formal methods researchers set themselves a deadline of they had to be able to get that feedback back in 10 minutes on average for a single diff. And they've been able to make both of those, uh, those goals. So it's scalable and it runs really fast. Um, but it's only proving the absence of null pointer exceptions and resource leaks. So, you know, what you're getting is much, much lower than what we were getting with the, the theorem prover full functional correctness formal methods tools. They're just starting here, so it's quite likely that they will be able to prove more and more properties. They could get up to the absence of runtime error kind of level in the graph that I started with. They're not going to get to full functional correctness in this kind of approach, so um, something to keep in mind. And then there's the problem of the fine print, right? All proofs come with assumptions. If you violate those assumptions, all bets are off. This is kind of like when you have a paper submitted to Usenix Security, if you don't have the what is your threat model, your paper gets rejected right away. This is what you should, exp you should look for in a formal methods paper. They don't actually get rejected if you don't have this yet, but they probably will eventually. Um, what are the assumptions, right? Because if the assumptions, like that's where you have to look to find problems, that's where you have to look to see, is this applicable to me? So those assumptions are really important and it's really easy to like ignore them. So John Rager is a researcher at Utah and he had this problem to use essentially fuzz testing to test compilers. So he reported in PLDI in 2011 that he found 325 bugs in C compilers and he found bugs in CompCert. You're like, but, but wait, like CompCert is this amazing verifying compiler that I just talked to you about. Like what, what's going on? Well, the CompCert bugs were found in the unverified front end, basically the parser, and a hardware model of the underlying system, right? So subsequently, these have been fixed and, and verified, so they're not there anymore. But still, you know, there were still bugs in the system because they were in the part of the system that wasn't functionally, wasn't verified. So the fine print's important. But even so, like in the paper, they talk about how 
the striking thing about CompSearch results is the middle end bugs that they found in every other compiler was missing. CompSearch is the only compiler they tested for which CSmith can't find wrong code errors. There weren't any bugs in the middle part of the compiler. And that wasn't for lack of trying. They spent six CPU years trying to find a bug in that part of CompSearch. So this is kind of like the red team results, right, for the SEL4, right? Somebody was really hard banging on this, trying to show that the formal methods claims were wrong, and they weren't able to do so. That doesn't mean you can't read, like, you still have to read the fine print, right? Okay, so that's an overview about the impediments to using formal methods. So where are we? So I've been talking mostly about using formal methods to find implementation bugs, and I started out by saying that that was only one part of a long list of things you have to do right in order to build a system that's reasonably secure. And that, that's certainly true. Formal methods tools are useful for more than just implementation bugs. They're also useful for faulty designs, for finding buggy specifications, and for, uh, for analyzing side channel attack information. Um, so I didn't have time to go into all of these, but you can use formal methods for more of these. So an example of the faulty design, Amazon Web Services are using TLA and model checking to find bugs in their design of their distributed systems, which they can eliminate before they go ahead and actually code them. And the people who use this tool basically said that they, the tool was finding bugs that they thought they would never find on their own, but that would occur in practice. One of the things they were talking about was when you're working on systems at the scale of Amazon Web Services, is programmer intuition about what a rare event is, is just completely wrong, right? There's so many events that things that people think are rare happen all the time. And so the using model checking to explore the design more exhaustively was very helpful in finding those bugs that people think won't ever happen, but in fact do happen all the time. An example of the buggy specifications is the Rockwell Collins example for the quadcopter, where they found that there was a side channel that wasn't properly cap that, right, that was being ignored in the theorem statement. And SEL4, one of the theorems they proved was that there was no timing channel information leak between different things running in different processes. So they proved that there was no timing channel information, they proved that there was no space information. If there was like some way of setting off some kind of radiation that could be read and transmitted, like they didn't prove that, right? You only prove what's captured in your model. So they're not actually proving that there's no information leak, they're just proving that the things that they modeled, which are the things that they know that they care about, are, are good. So it's again, it's like the fine print, right? The theorem's only as good as the set of assumptions or the things that are being modeled. And you can apply formal methods tools to third-party software as a way of mitigating the threats that are coming from third-party software. So it's still only part of the overall project, the overall problem of all the things you have to do, but it's a useful part. So what are some of the lessons that we've learned in using formal methods? One of them is don't try to verify existing code artifacts. In general, it's way, way harder to verify existing artifacts. It's much easier to write the code and the proof at the same time. So all except the, the work from Princeton on, SEL, on uh, SHA-256 and HMAC, they wrote the code and they wrote the proof at the same time. Also perhaps obviously is get rid of the obvious bugs before you start to prove that it doesn't have any bugs. So use static analysis and those other lower hanging uh, formal methods techniques before you try to, to prove functional correctness. You definitely don't want to verify all the code, right? No one is saying that we should verify every single line of code. That would take forever. All software development would come to a screeching halt. You really want to factor your code so that you have some really small core that you verify and then use that to build the security properties that you want over the whole system. This is like on the quadcopter, the SEL4 configured as a separation kernel meant that they didn't care whatever code was in the partition given to the red team, right? It actually had a camera in it that was taking pictures. So it, you don't have to trust that code. It can do whatever it wants and you know that it's not gonna break your system. You don't have to prove any properties about that code. The, uh, the team that did the verified um, browser used this to very good effect, right? They only had to verify something like 5,000 lines of code to be able to guarantee that two different tabs couldn't interfere with each other and that the address bar always showed the correct information and that cookies didn't leak from one partition to another. Uh, right, and then um, domain-specific languages are a really useful way of raising the level of abstraction. So a number of these teams have used domain-specific languages to write the code that they wanted at a really high level and then generate low-level code and generate proofs that that low-level code does what it's supposed to do. And automation is really essential. So I showed you the graph at the beginning of the performance of the SAT solvers. Um, so the continued speed of that and the ability of theorem provers to call out to SAT solvers to discharge key assumptions automatically is hugely important, as are tactic libraries. Tactic libraries are basically a way of scripting a theorem prover so that the computer does a lot of the work for you. So Adam Chapala, who's a professor at MIT, has made an art form out of building more and more efficient tactic libraries for COC. 
And with that, he was able to you know, help prove the file system was functionally correct in under five person years. And that five person year number for the file system is highly pessimistic in that that five person years is three professors and two grad students. And the three professors were like professors during that whole three, time, three years. So they definitely did not work on writing code for a full year each. And four of them were learning cock. So they also didn't really count as a full year. So that five number is extremely pessimistic. So the tactic libraries are really important. Okay, so this is an area of research that is exploding. There's tons of really good work going on and it's going to be continuing and there's a lot of really hard problems that still remain. So one of the really hard problems is if you're gonna prove properties of real software, well that real software, you have to, you have, to have a model of Linux or x86 or the browser API or the POSIX API in order to prove properties with respect to code that's using those things. And so a lot of work has to go into creating these interfaces and then validating these interfaces. So Peter Sewell at, at uh, Cambridge and um, is working on this quite a bit. And the, the bug in the ComSort compiler, one of them was in a model of the underlying hardware. So this is a you know, really important area. Um, it's, a, it's an area where you could imagine sort of different communities coming together and agreeing upon and validating a particular uh, um, model and then using it sort of both below and above. So you get people below the model proving that the implementation actually correctly implements this interface and that people above proving that whatever they're trying to do works as long as that interface is correct. So there's a real potential synergy there, but it's something that will take the community, I think, quite a while to develop. The proof engineering becomes really important when you start to get proofs that are 480,000 lines of code, right? You're starting to talk about, like when you get a program that that's big, that is that big, you expect there to be a bunch of tools to help you manage a code base that, that's big, that, that is that big. And the same is true on the proof side. People are starting to work on tools for managing the proof infrastructure. The paper that I mentioned earlier about the SCL4 experience, the transactions on, uh, in computing systems paper, talks a lot about how they've maintained the SCL4 proof over the past 10 years as they've added more features. Uh, they talk about how the how much effort it is to reprove something is very similar to how much effort it is to recode something. If a change is local, the reproof is really pretty easy. It's also local. If the change is global, the reproof is really painful because you have to go through everything and change it. Exactly the same way if you have a global change in a code base, the, the refactoring, the rewriting of the code itself is really difficult too. There's another big challenge in the getting the buy-in, right? Formal methods are a bad word to many people. They hear the word formal methods and they run streaming as far as possible. So the Amazon guys that decided to use the model checking to test their distributed algorithms, one guy started doing it and he was really successful and found a lot of things that were really cool. He convinced his buddy to try it on his buddy's project. His buddy had the same experience. So they're like, we've got to get more people doing this. How are we going to get more people doing this? It's like, well, we can't call it formal methods. If we call it formal methods, our colleagues will stop listening immediately. So instead they gave a talk about exhaustively testable pseudocode. And immediately after giving this talk about exhaustively testable pseudocode, many of their colleagues said, I want to do that. Like, come, you know, how can I help? So now they have 14 different groups using this particular approach. Um, but I think they were pretty smart at not calling it formal methods. Calling it exhaustively testable pseudocode was probably a really good idea. And then the elephant in the room and the elephant on the slide is handling concurrency. So many, many, many of the fine prints basically say, no concurrency, right? And Obviously, real code has a lot of concurrency, and so it's something that we have to be better at handling. There are formal methods-based tools for dealing with concurrency. It's not that people aren't working on this. It's just that the problem is even harder, right? This morning at the Hackham's PI meeting, somebody was saying that if the expert in concurrency said every lock you add doubles the proof obligations. So if you had a 10,000 line proof, you add a lock, now you have a 20,000 line proof, right? You obviously can't afford to have very many locks if it, that's the scaling rate. So there's a lot more work that has to be done on managing concurrency. But the talk this morning by Gurnet at SEL4 at, at NICTA had some really interesting ideas about how to do that. So I don't think this is hopeless. It's just something where the researchers in the formal methods community have a lot more work they have to do. Okay, so basically that's the the question, that, that set of technology, you know, are we within reach of sort of the dream that I would like to have, which is critical parts of critical systems are built out of verified components and their composition is verified to be correct, meaning that buggy software is no longer an easy uh, attack vector and that poor Black Hat is left with only non-scalable attack vectors, like where he has to go put a car, put a rock in a car to make it drive away. So we're left with the more physical based attacks, the things that don't scale as well. So thank you very much in questions, and I'll put it back to the uh, cartoon to have time to read. Question? <laughs>
time when um, grad students learning a language learn code well, so um, rather than a normal form of procedural language? So I'm not sure about instead, right? You have to understand kind of how to program as part of understanding how to use a, uh, a theorem prover. So, uh, it, so the same time might be a little bit tricky, right? You, you kind of have to break things down and teach one thing at a time, but potentially. But already at, at Harvard and Princeton and Penn, there are courses that are widely subscribed where people, like 50 students a semester who learn how to prove, write programs and prove properties about them in Coq. Um, in fact, I think there's like there's a there's a list of universities who are using this new textbook um, that's quite long of, that are doing this. So I, I think that like Andrew was telling Andrew Powell was telling a story yesterday about how his students from his class were going off to companies and were being upset that the companies didn't have theorem prover environment for them to work on when they were writing the code. They sort of expected that that was something that you would do as part of your code process. So I think it's it's a little bit of a uh, I, I mean I think there's still a long way to go before that's a real reality that everybody's, you know, that many people are doing that. But I think we're not as far from that as, as uh, people might think. Question? Yeah, so um, there's sort of the situation that just the act of formal modeling, formal verification, uh, and basically makes you actually come up with better designs. I think they talk about this in the SEL4 paper. And sort of related, I mean, my experience has been that very often I actually find bugs uh, before I actually run the model checker just by virtue of writing down the model. Uh, right. It makes you think about it uh, at a level of detail uh, that it also makes you often realize where the problems are. Right. And so I'm kind of wondering if there's maybe some avenue based on these observations where if you're really time constrained, you can't actually carry out the full coup. You can get some benefit by basically doing a certain degree of modeling and maybe right. some, like discharging some of these group obligations that seem particularly iffy, uh, but not actually right. carrying out the whole coup. No, I'm, I'm sure that's true, right? So the, the NICTA group, they've been porting SEL4 to many different architectures, and they haven't had time to prove that all of those ports are correct. So they're kind of doing exactly what you said, right? They're, they're writing the ports with the intent of doing the verification, with the understanding that's come, and come from having done verifications, but they haven't necessarily verified every different version. And so they're kind of, their verification, they were talking about them as verification ready. Um, so it's exactly what you're, what you're talking about. Is there a question from over here? Nope, okay, question. There are chances that the proofs are buggy. So one of the, the things that's going on here is uh, these proofs are all machine checked. So um, it's not just the person made a mistake. The person would have to make a mistake and the, the, the implementation would have to make a mistake. The implementation of the theorem prover would have to make a mistake, which is possible. Theorem provers are very complicated. But the theorem prover also emits a, uh, a trace of the proof. And that trace is in a standard format and can be checked by a very small piece of code. And so um, that's the current state of affairs. There's a very small piece of code that checks the proofs. Um, and that piece of code has been inspected by lots and lots of people, but it could have a bug in it. So yes, there's a chance, but we're sort of making the odds lower and lower that there's a mistake there. More questions? I was curious, so the, the sort of top level abstract property, properties that they proved about SEL4, uh, how complicated are they actually in terms of if you look at them written down? I mean, there are some part of these like 450,000 lines of, of, of proof. Uh, so how hard is it to actually understand these properties truly and what they mean and if they really mean what you think they mean? Right. Um, I think it's something where if you're an expert in cock, they're not that complicated to look at. If you're not an expert in cock, they seem hopelessly complicated. So somewhere in, you know, somewhere in between. But that's, a, you know, the proof is only as good as the model, right? And, and the model may or may not be what you actually understand it to be. So the, the gap between what you expect and what you wrote down is another important gap to work on, right? So, the, so uh, Hackens is really spoke, focusing on the verification problem, which is given a specification, did you correctly implement it? There's a whole other part of the problem, which is validation, which is, is the spec what you actually wanted? But actually having a formal spec is a good start on both of those parts of the problem because if you have a formal spec, then you can start to test the spec and use it as a, um, in a simulator and play with it and you sort of develop intuitions um, that, are, that are useful part of validating it. So you kind of can win on both sides, but those are, both, those are two really important things and I've been neglecting the validation part, really focusing on the verification part. Question?
Right. So uh, I think there, there, there are certain kinds of things like buffer overflows. There's kind of a general spec of follows this good software practice. And we've developed over time a pretty good understanding of what that good software practice is. And so people who do formal methods can write down the sort of good software practice specifications relatively easily. And those are the kinds of specs that the, um, the, the static analysis kinds of tools are, are checking, the ones that are kind of at the middle level. Then when you're coming to writing functional correctness kinds of specs, it's very similar to how do you write code in the first place? How do you think about what needs to be done? Uh, you, you write something down and then you, you play with it, you test it, you refine it as you're, either because as you simulate it, you realize it's doing the wrong thing or as you try to prove something about it, you find that it's not. Um, for crypto kinds of things, there are standard theorems that you want to prove, so you match up your specification with the standard theorems that you want to prove. Um, but it's part of the art form of using formal methods the same way that writing code is part of the art, it, it was part of the art form of building systems. You have to like think, you know, break it down. The skill set is actually quite similar, right? Proving properties and writing code, when you do both of them over a long period of time, you realize that they're really kind of the same thing. It's just what you're proving, what you're writing code over is different. In one case, it's the hardware, in the other case, it's a, a model of what's going on. Question? So on your chart of kind of the relative scalability and power of different approaches, you have type systems at like the very bottom of yeah. very scalable but not very powerful. Yeah. But there's a lot of work in like other stuff that I've seen here on using expressive type systems to kind of um, get more guarantees on language than you already would. And then also in just like developing more and more powerful type systems. Like I think this is an explicit design goal of Rust and Swift, for instance. Right. Do you, do you think that's another valid approach to get formal methods kind of in the, the broader sphere instead of the Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so one of the things that I didn't point out is that it says notional here. So this is yeah. very hand wavy, right? You could argue a lot about those middle bullets, where exactly they fit. Well, and certainly for the first two languages there, like that's absolutely what it was. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot of work like in dependent type systems, which you can think of dependent type systems as pulling a theorem prover into the type system. There's work in the Haskell type system of integrating SMT solvers into the type system. So again, you're kind of building up the type system so it has more and more of the aspects of things higher up on the scale, but it's still very scalable. So those are definitely directions that formal methods researchers are working on towards making it easier for many people to use the more powerful techniques than just simple type systems. Question? So, since you're sort of biased towards cockpit, uh, uh, is that like, for, for regular programmers, uh, is that what you would recommend to work? Uh, so, um, so, the SEL4 effort is in Isabel. All the rest of them are in cock. So, I was asking um, the NICTA folks yesterday, why is that? Um, Part of it is that they keep hiring everybody who does Isabel. So like, if you do Isabel, you're kind of in Australia working on SEL4 and its variants. Um, COC in the US is what professors are using, right? So Adam Chapala at MIT, Benjamin Pierce, Stephanie Weirich, Steve Zidanzoic at Penn, Greg Morissette at Harvard and now Cornell have all been using COC. And so the, the textbook material in the US is focused on COC and the professors and the students are focused on COC. And, once you start to get an ecosystem around you know, tactic libraries and artifacts that are in that system, it's easier to keep using that system. So I would say like in North America, it's probably easier to use COC. I think that they're, they're, they're not compatible with each other. It's not easy to translate something from Isabel into COC and vice versa. They're based on very different logical formalisms. Although like from the point of view of a user, the consumer, it's like, wh why do I care which one it was? So I would say that it's probably easier on, to use COC from here, um, but they're they're both good choices. Yeah. Uh, could you please give some uh, example of uh, SEO force uh, particular applications? And, uh, SEO force particular applications. Yeah. So SEO, a, a very close version of SEO four is running on uh, Qualcomm cell phones, uh, on the the cell phone part of the phone, not the app part of the phone. Um, it's running on. Um, Look, the quadcopter that I showed you, the helicopter that Boeing f did the flight test on, um, they just have a, a, in fact, tomorrow there's a, a SEL4 developers conference where four different companies who are starting to develop things on top of SEL4 are meeting with the SEL4 team to learn how to develop on top of that platform. So SEL4 is a research microkernel, right? It was published originally in SOSP in 2009. It's only 2015. So six years later, having it be shipping on like real systems is um, very, very fast, right? 
So, um, so the fact that it's already doing that in kind of baby prototype ways is, is quite impressive. I think it really does get to the fact that it is fast enough, even if it couldn't, isn't as fast as it could be. Um, but it's definitely not used like everywhere, everywhere, but it is on a lot of cell phones. Question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, So they do the timing channels. So the, the NICTA proof about separation kernel proves that there's no timing leaks between the different processes as well. They change the scheduler so that the scheduler didn't leak any timing information across them. So it, it, um, they can prove properties about things that they model. So the radiation uh, leak, for example, they're not, med they're not modeling that physical aspect at all, so they can't prove any properties about that physical aspect. If that turned out to be something that was really important, they could uh, add it to the model, and then there would be the question of how accurate is, how accurately are they capturing the model? Like reasoning about physics and continuous mathematics may be easy or may be hard. Like real numbers often throw huge monkey wrenches into things, but but uh, or floating point numbers throw huge monkey wrenches. Float real numbers are, are fine. So there are there are sort of there are tar pits that if you end up in the tar pit, it's really really hard. But you may or may not end up in the tar pit depending on what exactly you're trying to prove. So uh, I can't really answer in general. I can just sort of say this is what they. Um, the, the general approach, and they may or may not be able to succeed depending on exactly what the characteristic is. But there is formal methods work on various kinds of side channel kind of information. Yeah? So in the, in the late 90s, everybody was using DDDs for Boolean satisfiability, and now it's SMT. So I'm just curious if there's maybe actually another next thing around the corner that maybe <laughs> will make it more scalable. Uh, or is, I mean, so, you know, is there like any really promising work in the actual technology of those people? Well, certainly the, the SMT community is intend, you know, continually getting better and better. So I, I'm not actually a researcher in that area, so I don't really know if, they, if they're reaching the end or if they still have a lot of space to go. Right? BDDs are really good when you have kind of finite space, which is great for hardware, but for software, you don't have finite space. So uh, other approaches have turned out to be much more fruitful. I know one of the things that they're working on right now is um, how do you get it? So like if you have a, a model checker produces an answer, um, and now you have a theorem prover that wants to use that answer. Well, the theorem prover can't use it unless there's a proof that it's right. And model checkers are really complicated search procedures. So um, there's work going on uh, by Cesare Tenari, Tinelli, um, on having changing the model checker so that it, it produces both an answer and a breadcrumb trail that the theorem prover can then import and prove that the theorem prover that the model checker was correct in what it did without having to trust the whole code base of the model so checker. The model checker would be a very, very powerful exactly. So you're you're increasing the level of automation in the theorem prover by making it be able to call out to a model checker, right? Which then calls out to an SMT solver, right? So it's this big chain. More questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.